Praise be to God. Let us bow our heads in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, gracious God, we thank you for your blessings upon us today. We are among the living with all the devasta devastation and devastating effect of COVID-19. You have spared our lives and we are yet able to respond to your mercies and grace. So we pray for your divine protection upon those listening. We pray for recovery upon those who have been infected with this uh, disease that they will, they will experience your healing power in their lives. And at the same time, Father, I pray that you will enable us to be very wise, very prudent, and very and to practice all the necessary safety protocols and measures in order to keep, to keep ourselves safe and to keep our families safe. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise be to God. In these times, my dear brothers and sisters, uh, such a time as this, we have people who somehow are misquoting and misapplying the word of God for their own convenience. They want to present themselves as the one who possess the key to knowledge, to understanding, to the very deep things of God. They want to attract and to pull attention on themselves so that people would uh, embrace their ministry or even their wisdom. They are trying to seek for followers. But we are here today, this evening, to lift up Jesus. We are here to present his word as the source of life, the way, the roadmap that leads us to life eternal. So I'm going to share with you the relevance, the importance of trusting the word of God for the word of God sustain itself, it validates itself and it substantiates every truth and every statement, every prediction, everything that it says because God speaks through his word. And in God and with God, there is no deviation, there is no turning, there is no inconsistency with God. God is always consistent. God is always precise. God is always and always will be truthful and perfect. Therefore, whatever comes from God ought to be respected and valued. So the, the importance of divine inspiration and revelation is one that the Bible proves to us, shows us that the word of God is truly inspired. So what we're going to do, the exercise I'm going to share with you this evening is to compare the book of Revelation with the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible and the last book in the Bible. We're going to look at the similarities of those two books and how they speak of the word of, of the work of God through Jesus Christ. First, the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter one. We're going to look at the seven revelations of God in pairs, presented in pairs in Genesis and in Revelation. The reason for this is to foster and to uh, and, uh, reignite faith in the word of God. Trusting and believing in the word of God is essential to build faith because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. So when we hear the word of God and we see its accuracy and truthfulness, it will spark or reignite or establish faith in God and in his promise to us. What a time than now we need more of the word of God. The word of God surely is needed now than any other time in human history. So Genesis chapter one, and we're going to look at, we go to verse four. 
In verse 4, we see God created light. He separated light from darkness. In verse 4, he separated light from darkness. Then in verse 5, we are moving sequentially, verse by verse. In verse 5, then God separated night from darkness, from day. Night from day. In verse 5. In verse 6, God separated divided the waters from the waters. And we move on to verse 8 of Genesis. God separated or divided the evening from the morning. In verse 8. And then we move on to verse 10. We have a separation between earth and sea. In verse 10. So let me just go through this process again. God present heaven and earth, verse 1, light and darkness, verse 4, night and day, verse 5, waters from waters, verse 6, evening and morning, verse 8, earth and sea, in verse 10. Now these are six, six pairs of divine activity at creation. Six pairs of divine activity during God's work of creation. But there is, a, there is a seventh one. There is a seventh one. In verse 27, the word of God says in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. That's the last pair that God created at, uh, in Genesis during his creative activity. Seven pairs of divine activity denoting and presenting the relevancy of the inspiration and the revelation that is in his word. So when we looked at such a perfect a semblance of activity and how God precisely put them together, it tells us that this does not, did not happen by mere chance or accident, but by a genius mind, by creative design. God intentionally, my friends, intentionally put together his work of creation in such an orderly manner so that when we read the scriptures, we will have faith in God and in his word. Now let's turn to Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, the same as Genesis chapter 1. What we will discover in Revelation chapter 1 is how God did the same thing that he did in Genesis 7 Pairs, seven pairs, just like he did in Genesis. The creation was in seven pairs. Now we're going to see revelation in seven pairs, revealing and presenting the revelation of God in chapter one. Are you ready for this exercise? Let's go to chapter one of Revelation. Revelation chapter one, verse one says the, that the God spoke and present the message through his angel to John the prophet. The angel and John, that's pair number one. Angel and John, pair number one. And we find that in Revelation chapter one, verse one. Then we go to verse two. We move in sequentially, just like we did in Genesis chapter one. In verse two of Revelation, we find the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's another pair. The word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ in verse 2 of Revelation. Then we move to verse 3. Verse 3 says, He that readeth and they that hear. That's another pair. He that read and they that hear the word of God. That is verse 3. Then we move to verse 8. Verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. 
That is in verse 8, Revelation chapter 1. That's another pair. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Then we move to verse 11 and 12 of chapter 1. Revelation, verses 11 and 12. What do we find in verses 11 and 12 of Revelation? We find seven churches and seven golden candlesticks. Seven churches, seven golden candlesticks in verses 11 and 12. And then we go to verse 17. Verse 17. What do we find in verse 17? He is the first and the last. The first and the last. And then we move to verse 18. He has the keys of hell and of death. Hell and of death. Each of those statements present God's revelation in pairs. Tells us that the same God at creation is the same God who gave John the revelation. So creation meets revelation and we now as God's people when we read those passages and we see or we observe the perfect unity and symmetry that runs through the word of God it allows us to come to the understanding that the word of God is inspired. And because it is inspired, then we will develop faith in God. We will trust God more. We will rely on his promises and we will have a desire to be obedient to his will. Now let's go back to Genesis. We're going to go back and forth in Genesis and Revelation. First, we had the seven pairs of God's creative activity in Genesis. Then the seven pairs of divine revelation in Revelation. Then we're going to look at the seven worship scenes in Genesis. The seven worship scenes or the seven worship acts or activity in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we find that the Bible says that God created the seventh day, the Sabbath, and he rested, he blessed, and he sanctified it. A day that is blessed, a day that is sanctified, denotes an act of worship, the purpose and God's intention. But Adam and Eve, if the Sabbath was made for Jews, then... Adam and Eve must have been the first Jewish pair because we are looking at the establishment and the institution and the revelation of the seventh day Sabbath. It was not created after the fall of man. Oh no, the Sabbath was not created after the fall of man or after sin. It was created, instituted by God before there was anything called sin. Before sin. As a matter of fact, there are two institutions, there are two things that are clearly presented in history that has nothing to do with sin, and that is marriage between man and woman and the Sabbath. And I'm pretty sure that people who embrace the institution of marriage would never associate marriage to, Jew, to Jewish people. They would never say marriage was made for the Jews. Oh, no, they will not say that. <laughs> they will not say marriage was made for the Jews. The Sabbath and marriage exist before sin. So if the Sabbath was not for the Jews, therefore marriage also was not for the Jews. Both of them were created for the happiness and well-being of mankind. Then we move on to Worship in relation to uh, gratitude, gratitude and appreciation for God. In Genesis chapter 4, uh, we find the story of Cain and Abel. 
And the story of Cain and Abel is a very sad one because Cain and Abel was born after sin. They were the first, Adam and Eve after the fall, they began to have children and Cain and Abel came on the scene. And uh, we find in response to God's, God's goodness and mercy, they were supposed to render to God acts of worship by virtue of presenting him with a, a unique and special sacrifice. But unfortunately, Cain uh, did not present to God what he had required. He decided to do his own thing and present his own style of worship. What was the response? The Bible says that God did not honor Cain's offering, but rather God accepted Abel's offering. That tells us that when it comes to worship, we cannot be arrogant we cannot be conceited. We cannot be self-opinionated. When it comes to worshiping God, we must render to God the right worship in the right manner, in the right form. And so therefore, this is an object lesson in Genesis that proves and shows us that when it comes, when, when we are worshiping God, we must worship God in the right way, the right manner, responding to him in the way that he requires us to do. And then this brings us to um, the, the building of Noah's Ark in Genesis chapter 8. Worship in relation to the building of the Ark. Now, this story, the story of the flood, my friends, is not a myth. It is not fiction. It is a reality. Because archaeological finds prove to us today that there had been a global flood. Yes. Why do we have um, such um, faith in believing this? Because they have found seashells. Seashells. Um, the fossils of fish has been found on top of mountains. Now, how could a fish swim all the way to top, on top of a mountain where archaeologists have discovered seashells and, and skeletons of fossils, fossilized remains of fish on top of mountains or deep down in the, in the layers under the the, uh, the bosom of mountains. So that tells us, according to those finds, that there at one time water had risen to that level. And the Bible makes it clear, the story is clearly revealed in uh, the, the, epi the episode of the, uh, the Noah's flood. And then we move on to uh, Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, Abraham. You see, Abraham proved uh, that he believed in the true God and therefore he responded by exercising his faith in God when God asked him to present or to offer his son Isaac. Abraham trusts God. He followed God. You will find this story in chapter 22, chapter 22 of Genesis. And as a result of Abraham's faith in God, unquestioning faith in God, um, God performed a miracle for him and God provided a substitute lamb. That tells us that the, the promise that God had made to save humanity was prefigured or demonstrated through Abraham's act of faith. Like he, went, he was about to sacrifice his son Isaac, reveals to humanity, God revealed to humanity that he will, son, he will send his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for us so that we will be redeemed from sin. Jesus came. He was born in Bethlehem of Judea. He grew up in Nazareth. He was baptized in the river Jordan. And John the Baptist proclaimed 
to him to the entire nation. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. So through Abraham, God showed us that the one who redeems us is the one who ought to receive true worship. Jesus Christ, the redeemer of the world. Then Genesis tells us and reveals to us worship in relationship to Abraham's son, Jacob. Jacob had a twin brother named Esau. One, according to the, uh, um, the patriarchal system, the firstborn son was to receive the birthright. In other words, the firstborn son typified the, the Messiah lineage, which means that through the firstborn son, the promise of the Messiah would come. But unfortunately, we see according to the word of God in Genesis chapter 28, that Esau did not show any interest in spirituality. Esau was more concerned with his stomach, with his belly. But Jacob was concerned about spirituality, about worshiping God. And so therefore we find through those, the, um, the narrative of those twin brothers, today human beings find themselves into two camps. Two camps. The camp of those who are loyal and faithful to God, who are seeking after spirituality and salvation, and those who are more concerned about fulfilling the desires of the flesh. The question is, when it comes to worship, who do we, how do we render our act of worship? Worship ought never to be to please self, but worship ought to be to please God. We have to put self aside and trust God when it comes to worship. We live in a world that is self-centered. People are more concerned with how they feel and what they want. But we have to put these things aside. And, and as demonstrated through the narrative story of Jacob and Esau, one received the blessing, the other did not, shows us today people who are careless and indifferent will not receive the inherited blessing of God. Then we move to Revelation. We go now to Revelation. And we're going to look at the scenes of worship in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 through 12, Revelation chapter 4, you could write those passages down. In the interest of time, we wouldn't have to go through them word by word, line by line, but you write them down for verification. In chapter 4, verses 8 through 12, we is, is presented the worship in relation to the throne of God in heaven. We are told that um, the angels of God bow before the throne of God and they rendered unto him true worship. Then we follow this scene in Revelation and we see re worship in relation to the to the to, to the divine to the divine um, act of God in chapter five verses eleven through fourteen. Then we move on, we see worship in relation to the sins of God who passed through great tribulation. Because of their experience, they went through great tribulation in chapter 7, verses 11 through 12. They worshiped God, they rendered worship to him because God gave them salvation. Then we see worship in relation to the seven trumpets of God mentioned, symbolic language there, chapter 11, verses 16 through 17. Then we see worship in relation to Mount Zion and the Lamb in chapter 14. And then we see worship in relation to the seven vials of divine wrath in chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And then we see worship in relation to the marriage supper of the Lamb in chapter 19. Seven scenes of worship in Revelation from chapter 4 all the way through chapter 19. Now, let me just recap and go back to Revelation. In Revelation, there are seven scenes of worship presented from chapter 2 
to chapter 32 in Genesis. And then chapter in Revelation, we see also seven acts or seven scenes of worship in the book of Revelation. So why is this so important to us? Is to show us how inspired the word of God is. You notice something very unique about each of those activities or acts. It is numbered seven, seven times sequentially, just like the seven days of creation. We see the number seven as a number denoting perfection. So it is by design that God, through the inspiration of his word, is bringing to our attention the uniqueness of the seventh day Sabbath, the uniqueness of worship, the uniqueness of rendering to God true obedience, not the way we as human beings perceive and want to worship God, but the way God prescribed that we should worship him. Now also, um, I want to present to you uh, 14 allusions to worship, again, in Revelation, in pairs. Because when you split 14 in two, you have seven on one side and seven on the other side. The worship in Revelation and worship in Genesis is that what happened in Genesis is a replay of what is happening or what has happened in Revelation. Why? Because Jesus, the true witness, says he is Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and he is the end. And therefore, he has the keys of life and death in his hands. Because Jesus has the keys, he has unlocked the mystery of the gospel. So Jesus Christ is the center and the central figure of all divine revelation. Jesus Christ came to present to us the correct understanding of who God is. Remember the disciples asked him the questions. They asked him, Lord, would you show us the Father? And he answered them and said, how often or how long rather I have been with you and yet you are asking me to reveal to you the Father. He says, I and the Father are one. In other words, the work that he did, the acts of worship, the manner in which he ministered to people, the way he showed compassion, um, extended grace, the way he forgave people for their sins is exactly the way the Father would have done it if the Father was walking on earth as Jesus walked. In other words, there is no separation when it comes to divinity. Jesus does not act or function outside of the will of his Father. This tells us that when it comes to truthfulness, when it comes to truthfulness of the word of God, we as believers, we as human beings should never deviate nor operate outside of the will of God. When it comes to salvation, my friends, we have to put aside our own prescri prescribed manner or ideology or the way we think or conjure up what and how salvation should be rendered to man. It does not work. We must lay aside our own human reasoning and trust God depending upon his, what he has revealed to us. The reason why this is so important because anything that is done out of sight is not faith. Faith requires us to act upon the things that we cannot handle or touch or see. You see, the Bible says, blessed are those who have not seen but yet believe. We today, living in the 21st century, 
we have not seen Jesus. But we believe that Jesus Christ came. Why? Because the word of God revealed to us who Jesus is. The real Jesus. The theme for our presentation for the past months. The real Jesus. The real Jesus, my friend, in Revelation is the one who came, died on the cross of Calvary. He was buried. He arose from the grave. He ascended up to heaven. Now, today, he is interceding and soon to return back to this earth as king of kings and lord of lords. Remember last presentation, we talked about the lion and the lamb. When he came the first time, he came as the lamb. But this time he is coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now remember in Genesis, we have all the stories relating or pointing to, in figurative language, who Jesus will, how Jesus will come, in what form he will come, and what work will he do. You see, in Genesis, the act of worship was demonstrated when Abel presented a lamb sacrifice, but Cain did not. At the flood, those who respond in obedience to God, we see even through the time before the flood, there were seven days, seven days before the rain precipitated and the door of the ark was shut. Why seven days at the flood? Because the seven days at the flood before the rain precipitated correlates with the seven days of creation and with the seven acts of God in pairs. Notice in pairs. But when human beings refused to enter the ark, God told Noah, order the animals to enter into the ark. Guess how? By pairs. The animals went in by pairs. But when it came to the clean animals, God said to Noah, I want you to order them to enter in by sevens. Very significant. Because at creation, God created everything in six days and he made them in pairs. And now... The story of the flood, which is depicting a new act of creation, which God was about to perform. He had the animals who enter in the unclean ones in pairs, in twos, but the clean ones in sevens. So the God of creation is the same God at the flood. And then we come to Revelation. Seven churches. Seven stars, seven spirits, seven angels. And this is where I am going to show you in Revelation all of the different descriptions that are given to us to prove to us the inspiration of the valley and the revelation of God through his word. First, we have seven churches, chapter 1, verse 4. Seven spirits of God. Chapter 1, verse 4. Seven golden candlesticks. Chapter 1, verse 20. Seven stars. Chapter 1, verse 20. Seven angels. Chapter 1, verse 20. Seven lamps of fire. Chapter 4, verse 5. A book sealed with seven seals. Chapter 5, verse 11. The beast with seven horns. Chapter 5, verse 6. The seven angels with seven trumpets. Chapter 8, verse 2. The seven thunders uttered their voices, chapter 10, verse 3. 7,000 men slain in chapter 11, verse 13, by the, uh, the, the, the witnesses. Great red dragon is presented in chapter, with seven heads in chapter 12, verse 3. Seven crowns upon the head of the, the, um, the dragon or the beast. Chapter 12, verse 3. Seven angels holding the seven 
last plagues. Chapter 15, chapter 15, seven angels with the seven trumpets. Chapter 15, verse 1. Seven vials of God's last plagues. Chapter uh, 15. Seven mountains is described in chapter 17, verse 9. Seven kings in chapter 17, verse, verse 10. My dear friends, it is not by accident, but by design to show us that the word of God is truly inspired. It is trustworthy, trustworthy, that we could depend upon it. Praise be to God for the revelation of his word. So, Revelation and Genesis complement each other. Hence the reason why the angel told John, blessed is he that hear and those that read the word of God. Today, majority of religious people have put aside the book of Revelation. They claim that the book of Revelation is a sealed book. They claim that it is incomprehensible. But I want to let you know that the star of Revelation is Jesus Christ. He is the centerpiece of Revelation. He is the one that holds the key. He is the one that unlocks. He is the one that presents to us the golden truth that runs like a thread from Genesis all the way down to Revelation. He is the one that was prefigured by the Lamb. And in chapter 5 revelation of Revelation, it says that Jesus Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. John the Baptist, John the Revelator, both testified that Jesus Christ is indeed the one who takes away the sins of the world. Today we have people who are looking to different religious leaders and figures, icons from different persuasions as a means to grant them some form of inspiration and perhaps salvation so they think or claim. But there's only one person, there's only one unique individual throughout the history of humanity presented from Genesis to Revelation, that can cleanse us, forgive us, and accept us, and grant us eternal life to save us from all the corruption that is in this world, to grant us, to grant us joy, peace, happiness in this world, beyond the pandemic, beyond any other economic depression or condition, political upheaval, Wars, tribulations, all kinds of conditions that we may confront. Jesus Christ, my friend, is the answer. He is the solution. So may God bless you this evening. And I hope that the exercise that I've shared with you from the word of God, particularly those two books, as we looked at the way God presents his acts of creation, his acts of revelation, and how precise, and how unique they are in complementing each other. It is my prayer that it will reignite your faith in God so that you could walk by faith, my friends, and not by sight. So may God bless you. And um, I believe that we're going to open the floor for your questions, any question that you may have relative to the presentation for this evening, it is my joy to accommodate and to respond to you from the word of God. Praise God. Thank you very much, Pastor uh, Lawrence. Indeed, we appreciate what you've done for us, Doc, and what you have shared with us. Uh, as I was trying to digest the wealth of information that you set before us uh, from the Word of God, both from the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and the last book of the Bible, and to see how they parallel uh, one to another. 
I, I see two schools of thought that I would like to digest what you shared us from, um, rather how you, what you have shared us. First, uh, on one hand, I see creation by the tri, triune God, the three in one God. And then and secondly, I see the importance of worship. So on one hand, creation telling us that Jesus, along with God the Father, God the Son, the three in one God, is creator, redeemer, sustainer of this entire cosmos and the, all of us. And then the, on the other hand, the Bible is pointing us, may it be Genesis or Revelation, is pointing us to our solemn duty, which is to worship God, this God who creates and redeem and sustain. Is this a fair um, assessment of what you share with us so far? Absolutely. Indeed, because the centerpiece of the scriptures, particularly the last book, which summarizes everything that is written from Genesis all the way down, is God calling upon his creation to worship him, the one who made heaven and earth. And the antithesis, the opposite of worshiping God is to worship the beast or the dragon. So from the very beginning, the devil, or the enemy, the arch enemy of God, have tried to move you, his creation away from worshiping the true God. That's why he led Adam and Eve against God. He led Cain against God. He led the antediluvians, the people at the flood, against God. They choose not to worship the true God. We see how Abraham chose to worship God. We see how Jacob chose to worship God. The opposite, the antithesis of that, where God has had people uh, from the very beginning who choose and those who did not worship him in the right way, will culminate in the end in the same format. Those who worship God, those who don't worship him. Those who worship him in the right way, those who don't worship him in the right way. Those who worship him on the right day and those who don't worship him on the right day. Everything is precise. So as you shared that the first book and the last book kind of encapsulate the, the totality of the Bible, and again, you further uh, agree that it's, it's both books along with the entire Bible is speaking to creation and telling us that it's the God, Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who creates, and then we are to worship him. Now that we have established these facts, now, how about as we deal with this, as we deal with all of us, the 8 billion of us living on planet Earth, 8 billion of us here, um, uh, as you know, we often share in the show that the Abrahamic faith that consists of the Jewish, of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity made up approximately 5 to 5.5 of the 8 billion of us here living on planet Earth. And so, so as such, the uh, uh, Bible, all, one of the issues that even these religions have outside of Christianity is the issue, is Jesus worthy to be worshipped? Is Jesus worthy to be worshipped? And us in the Christian faith that claim that approximately 3 billion of us, we are saying, yes, Jesus is worthy to, to be worshipped. But as we deal with the Muslim and our Islam, our, our Judaism, our Buddhism, our all the different ism of religion, even Rastafarian, and all the various religions out there, the other five billion people that doesn't see Jesus Christ as worthy uh, to be worshipped. Now, as you deal with these book, both Genesis and Revelation, what it is the, the, the message it's saying to not just the Christians 
the eight billion, the three billion of us, but also the other five billion of us who don't see Jesus Christ as divine and worthy of our worship. What is the Bible is saying to us, particular Genesis and Revelation, as you share, share with us this parallelism? Yeah. Well, what, one thing is is for certain. All the different people groups and all of the different religions and isms that you have mentioned, they have all of them have something in common, including Christianity. <clears throat> all of them believed in creation. All of them believe that God created the heavens and the earth. They do. They do. Majority Muslims believe that God created um, the. Um, the other major religions believe in the God of creation. They call him by different names. Christianity, likewise. So the act of divine creation is a revelation to all of them. Which means that, according to what the Apostle Paul says, they are without excuse. The creation reveals the glory of God. So they are without excuse. The question of worshiping Jesus or to accept Jesus as God and worship him is not something that is difficult for God to solve. It is not difficult for God to solve that. You see, we may think of us as Christians as the only one that God is revealing his will to. But God is speaking to those people from other denominations and other creeds and other sets in a direct as well as an indirect manner. Way which God chooses. Now, you see of all the, um, the, thing, the things that are happening in this world, the pandemic, the wars, the earthquakes, the floods, and all of these things, human suffering, there is one person, there's one person that unites everybody together by his mercy and grace, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus, in a very unique way, in fact, let me, let me just give you one example. There was a particular Christian who went to a Muslim country. And he was wondering how could he tell them about Jesus so that they will accept and embrace the message of Jesus. What he did, he says, he began to do the very things that Jesus did when Jesus was on earth. What was the works that Christ did? Christ ministered to the sick. Christ fed the hungry. Christ clothed the naked. Christ set the captives free. Christ exorcised those who were demon-possessed. And the Christians began to do the very same work that Christ did. And guess what? Without him preaching to anyone, all of them came to him and they said, the work that you do must be God's work. Must be God's work. Nobody who does not have God, how could you cast out demons? How could you feed so many people? How could you show so much compassion? And how could you establish medical ministries where you could heal and minister to the sick and the sufferings? When they approach him, he told them, it is because of Jesus Christ. I am doing his work. And that opened the door. Christianity need to stop pushing Christ down people's throat and start doing the work of Christ so that the work of Christ will convict and convince people. Here's what Jesus says. By this shall men know that ye have my disciples if ye have love one for another. I remember reading a statement from uh, someone who was interviewing the, head, the, great, the great Mahatma Gandhi. And they said to Mahatma, you know, Mahatma was the found, um, father of um, modern India, he was the one who led India to independence under the British colonial rule. 
and uh, Mahatma was preaching nonviolence and the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the meek, blessed are those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness for the church. That's what he was preaching. So they said to him, Mahatma, how can you say you are a Hindu and you are preaching the gospel of Jesus? Are you a Christian? And the great Mahatma Gandhi answered and said, Christianity, no, but Jesus, yes. There is not one person in the world, regardless of their religious affiliation or background or nationality, that would reject the grace of mercy, grace, compassion, forgiveness, healing. You tell me who will reject somebody who will come to them and offer them food. Who will reject somebody who will come to them and offer them lodging and clothing and shelter? Who will reject somebody who will come to you and present when you are sick, present you with medicine and healing? Who? All of humanity embrace the acts of love and kindness. And that's Jesus. That's Jesus. And the way you worship Jesus is to embrace his, his acts, his deeds. When you accept Christ's deeds, you have embraced him. And in a unique way, you are rendering worship to him. Praise God. Is there a statement or a question? Good evening. I have a question. Is everyone yes, that does uh, good deeds, uh, can they be classified as, as Christians or followers of Jesus? If we see people out there doing things that seem good, looks good, uh, do we call them Christians? or we may, we, we may not call them Christians, or we don't have to call them Christians, but we could call them children of God. We call them children of God. Thank because you. They, because they're doing God's work. You know, sometimes a labeling or using a name can create division or separation. For example, we are Christians, right? But people call us Seventh-day Adventists. They call us Pentecostal. They call us Baptists. They call us... So those names are not the important thing. The important thing is by their fruits you shall know them. And that's what God is looking for, you know. When Jesus Christ comes... He's not going to ask us from which church or which denomination or which, where we did affiliate. No, 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 no. He will say, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison, you came to visit me. I was homeless and you brought me in. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me water to drink. And then we will say, Lord, when did we see you to do such great deeds? As much, in as much, Jesus says, as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. So people who are doing those good deeds are literally following Jesus unbeknown to them. They are following Jesus because Jesus will say, in as much as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. So there are Muslims, Baptists, all kinds of people, they are following Jesus and they don't even realize it. You see, denomination and a name of churches and religion, these things are, this, this is a smokescreen. The devil is using that to confuse people and to separate people. But at the final analysis, Pastor Barnaby, just like we studied from creation, Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, the people who were saved in the flood, those who were destroyed, the two groups of people continue to run through the garment of scripture all the way down to Revelation. And Jesus says, the sheep will be on the right hand, the goat on the left hand, the wheat and the tears. There are two places where human beings will end up, final destiny, destination, heaven and hell, eternal life, eternal damnation. Now, hear my follow-up, uh, 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 Pastor. Among us, we have atheists and agnostic, even in real time on this platform right now. So we have Christians, we have Muslim, we got Jews, we got atheists, 
we got agnostic, we have all the, a mixture of all of us here. In the, the common thread that you express in different ways from Genesis to Revelation, or from Revelation going back to Genesis, and you mentioned that, that there are two groups of people, one that will come to the knowledge of God and one that will walk away from God. How do you speak to all 8 billion of us and the subgroup within the 8 billion of us? Some of us are atheists, some of us are agnostic, some of us are Catholic, some of us are Adventist. What is God saying to us when God say, come out of her, my people? Is God saying we must come out of, the, of that which the devil enthrop? To, uh, that, that the devil set up, or the trap that the devil has set up to deceive you, the human race? Everybody, everyone will never come out of Babylon. They will never come out of their religious um, groupings. Um, they will not do it. As a matter of fact, what God has asked us to do is to witness to all the world. He says to witness to all the world. Jesus never never commissioned us to convert the world. The world, he knew that the world will never be converted. The world will never be converted. There are millions and billions of people that will never respond to Jesus. They will not. You know, how long did Noah preach to the antediluvians? I mean, we are told, right? 120, 120 years. And, and how many people responded? In the final analysis, eight. <laughs> How about Sodom and Gomorrah? Same How thing, many under, out? under 10. Okay. So throughout history, we have example after example of the majority of people who would adamantly reject the, the invitation to turn to God as plainly as it could possibly be presented, as clearly as daylight. They are human beings who will still stand against it and reject it there's nothing we could do about it and not not even god himself can do anything about it because god will never force anybody to serve him or to turn to him the bible is replete with the whosoever will the whosoever will we are created free moral agents and we have to demonstrate our love to god by making a conscientious decision out of our own free will to serve God out of love and gratitude and sincere appreciation, never by compulsion, never by coercion, never by uh, any force measure. It has to be out of our desire, own heart that we choose, we choose. Jesus says there are two roads, one that leads to eternal life and the other to destruction. Broad is the way, broad is the way. But it is crooked that leads to uh, destruction. But the way that leads to eternal life, Jesus says, it is narrow, but guess what? It is straight. And he says, few, Jesus says, few there be that go in their heart. So when we look at the billions of people, the population of this world, unfortunately, when we study the Bible, we study the scriptures, God never promised us that all 8 billion people will turn to God now. So, given, the, given that we have known that, what is our responsibility in terms of the proclamation of the gospel? Yes, it, to, to witness, to witness. Jesus says, as a witness unto all nations, so that at the end of the day, nobody will have an excuse and say they did not hear or they did not know. They will have to make a conscious decision after they hear the gospel. So what we are doing right now, we are doing exactly what Christ asked us to do. We have to make it as abundantly clear and plain as possible 